Okay, that's me now, I think we are on. That's me one more time. Welcome at the second week uh, of March 110. Uh, I hope the first week went nice and smooth. Thank you for introducing yourself on, um, on the discussion board. It's really nice and really interesting to read uh, things about you, about my students. Uh, also, thank you for taking review quiz and the syllabus quiz. It's always good to, to know how to navigate and to know the, the dynamic and the mechanic, mechanics of the online course. Uh, that's been what we will do. I will always run a weekly session. Uh, Dr. Smith will also uh, run a session. I think he did on Tuesday, but he will just go like broadly, like he will just tell you overview uh, of the particular lesson, particular week. And I will try to uh, focus on the main concept and solve a question for you, which will be helpful for your weekly assignments. Also, I saw not, not everybody, but quite good group of people which actually took a, a lesson one quiz. It's also good. I've got an email. Uh, somebody asked me if, if the first attempt, if you will get like 100%, of course, you don't have to take the second attempt because taking both of them, uh, will, the best score will count anyway. You can always take as a practice. It's, it's always good to, to double check yes, if your, your knowledge, but of course, from the point of view, it's, we will count the best, the best score out of these two tests. Okay, that's two minutes announcement. Uh, always please use the discussion board if you have any questions. Uh, also, please, uh, you, you can email us, but if it's, especially if it's the math question, please use the discussion because then we can answer, um, some, somebody else can answer, like students can answer the question between each other. It's also excellent learning uh, tool. Okay, that means in lesson one, which is week, this week, uh, we covered the first part of chapter one. Chapter one is still not calculus. Chapter one is just the review of the function, of different type of function, rate of change, uh, different types of, of rate of change. That means we will just try to, to go uh, through all of these sections. That's what we can see from section 1.1 to 1.5. We will talk about function, linear function, average rate of change or relative rate of change, some application of the function in finance, in economics, and at the end, a little bit of exponential order, exponential function. Okay, let's start. I will try to, we have to mute the microphone. Can you see me? I'll mute for you, and I will also stop a video. Oh. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, that means let's start my first. Uh, I will, what I will do, I also didn't really copy um, a theoretical part. I think the textbook is excellent, it's great. It's everything It's explained really easy. It's nice and easy to follow. That means we will, I will always uh, solve a particular questions that I think are crucial for your success. Okay, that means question number one, example number one. Uh, oh, okay, let's read. Suppose that the function P of T estimate the population of a town in thousands, T years after year 2000. Okay, that's when we do have a function that represents um, a population. Interpret the statement P of six is equal to 55. Right? That means what, what we think. We've, we know that 55, uh, 55 is actually a population in the town but six is telling me that six years passed after 2000. That means in 2006, the population was 55,000. We did have 55,000, I can write this, of population. Yeah, that we can see, e really easy question. 
55,000 population, 50, 55,000 people. But that's important, 2006, right? because the function initial value is at, everything starts at 2000. Okay? I mean, I can, I don't know, but I can guess P at zero, hmm, let's say 50. Okay? That means this means that initial number of population was 50,000 means in 2000. Zero. Okay, that means hopefully you will get the, you will, uh, you will, know the correct description, correct interpretation. Okay, now linear function. Which of the following tables uh, could represent a linear function? And we do have set of three values, I mean set, the set of three tables. Um, I did type like a little bit of description. That means having a values, having a values x and y, of course, we should be able to create an equation of the linear function, which is simply defined as a mx plus b. Yeah, you probably remember. Can you tell me what m means? Do you remember something from algebra, from pre-calculus? What is m and what is b? That's b, not six. You can type on the chat box. It's the slope. Mm -hmm. Is the slope and the y-intercept slope? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Really good. Okay. That means this is definitely a slope. And this will be the y-intercept. Or we can call because since we will do lots of application, instead of saying y-intercept, we can say like a vertical, vertical intercept. Because not always on the vertical line, we will have a y-label. Okay. That's what we can say y intercept. Okay, and you may probably read, I will I can read for you. How can we recognize which one is actually a linear a relation? We have to make sure that the difference in y, we can see difference in y values is constant for the equal difference in x. Okay, that we have to have the same difference between y's. At, at the same time that x has the difference, difference uh, identical. Okay, that means let's see. What do you think for value, for the table A? Uh, x is a zero, one, two, three. That means we have just they they increasing by one in this table. Okay, and then the corresponding value for zero is twenty seven. The corresponding value for one is twenty five, which is two less. Corresponding value for two is 23, which is also two less from the previous one, and 21, and so on. That means do you think is this is the this is the good um, uh, the linear uh, linear um, relationship? What do you think? Is this good? Do you think I can get an equation m x plus b? Yeah, it is. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madi, for, for confirming. We do have quite, yes, quite good group of students today. That means you can try to type anything, even we can really treat this, this session as a normal class, like a face-to-face. -face. I know it's, it's not face-to-face, -face, but we can definitely try to do the same. You can answer a question, even if it's wrong, doesn't matter. It's a process of learning. Uh, okay, that means this is definitely linear. We can see it. As x is uh, increasing by one, that means the uh, changes in x is just one, changes in y is negative two. Yeah, that means that, and we remember slope delta y over delta x, changes in y, changes in x. And we do have changes in y, negative two, changes x is they, they jump by one. That means slope is negative two. That means I can see negative 2x. And what do you think? Because if we're actually lucky, can you tell me what is y-intercept? Looking at these numbers? Do you think one of them is telling me 27, 25, 23? Which one is telling me an intersection with y-axis? Oh, can you see zero? Yes, yes, thank you, 27, right. Because if x is zero, that's the value on the y-axis, and this is uh, y-intercept, okay? That's what we actually got, not even using some formulas, uh, 
Uh, of course, we did have the fundamentals, mx plus b, but negative 2x plus 27, really good. Okay, let's see because we, we do have another one. Okay, table b. X is change, the, the change, they changes by five. Okay, that we have to be careful. Five, 20, 25, 30. And let's say the Y values, are they also changed by the constant number? Um, 62, 72, 82, 92. That means yes, they, yes, thank you, Craig. They jumping by 10. That means I can say that the changes, I would like to write, the changes in X is positive 10, but what about my denominator? What about the changes in, uh, in X? What shall I put here? Can somebody tell me? Because the previous one was one, five, thank you. Oh, okay, you're good. That means you can see, I can maybe write here, the slope is two, because we're always looking like rise of a run, okay? Like how, how many units I'm going like up and how many units to the right. That means changes in Y and X. Okay. Let me, oh, actually, let me remove this. I can possibly write here, delta Y over delta X. This is 10 and this is two. Five, not two, I was five. That means the slope is two. But do you think, can you tell me the Y intercept? Because I will need, at 2x plus, and I need the b value. Uh, okay, 32, correct, let's see, probably, because what we see, we don't have the value for zero, but we can try to get back, and uh, we can get the value for 10, I can build the table backwards, we can get the value for five, and we can get the value for zero, which will give me the y intercept. And I can simply subtract 10. 52, 42, and yes, you write Craig, it's 32. Really good. That means I will place in the formula. Okay, that means we can see, even having a data, that's what, mo that's what is sometimes, like in, in, in economics, finance, we have some data and we don't know what to do. As soon as we have some model equation, it's much, much easier to make, to analyze. Okay, that we have the equation. I can box the second equation. And what about C? Do you think it's a linear relation? Uh, X's are changing one, two, three, four, okay, by one. But what about the Y values? Five and 10, we add in five. Okay, and then unfortunately, we're not adding five, eight, 10, we're not really adding the same value of uh, subtracting. That means the difference is not constant. This is not a linear relation. I don't know, maybe, maybe it's um, exponential because it's growing quite fast, but then I really have to check the, the, the percentage, the rate, the rate of change. That means we, we, yeah, we will leave it for now. The easiest way is to find the linear. Okay. Let's keep moving. That means you're okay with general function, you're okay with the linear function. Let's see. Let's find the equation of the line with the slope one third and passing through the point negative four seven. That means this one is typical mathematical question. We can see we have no data. We just did, we found the equation of the line, but we based on the points, based on the data. But now, no problem, we can, I mean, we can, ha we can have two different ways. We may start with the standard plus B, right? Actually, let's do this way. I know the slope is one third and B, I don't know. But I do have a point. I have point negative four seven, okay? That means this will be my X and this is my Y value. And actually that's, seven and this is negative four and I think substituting to my equation I can solve for b. That means let's try b will be seven plus four fair. That's b. I don't know if I like b because it looks like six. 
I think I know because this will be negative four thirds and I have to add to both sides. Um, this will be one eight and one third, or if we prefer 25 over three. Okay, that means that's the way to find it. That means the equation is one more time, one third x plus 25 over three. This line has a slope one third and it's going through the point negative four seven. Okay, we can see how nice we can get the equation. Okay, any question, please, yes, please ask. If you don't understand something, really, this is the time that I can, I can help you. I know that we can use the discussion board, but please, please. Let's see another question. Oh. What is my question? Let the function f of x be defined as a square root of the quantity five minus x squared. Calculate f of x plus h. Oh, we do have a question. Uh, so you just use the points and substitute. Yes, I can come back. Exactly. Because we know, we know that this is the point x, y. This is the point that satisfies my equation mx plus b. That means I know my M, I know X and Y, that means I can use it to get B. But even now I can check, I can substitute, um, I can substitute instead of seven, uh, instead of Y seven, instead of uh, X negative four, and I believe my left and the right hand side will be the same. Yeah? Because this point satisfies the line, which means, um, it's placed, it lies on the, on the line. We can check, I will not do it, but you can, we can definitely. I mean, it's easy, negative four thirds minus 25 thirds, 21 thirds, 21 over three, of course it's seven. Yeah. But when you can, yes, you can rewatch, you can rewatch this session and you can look at the process and try to, to do the same thing, okay? You can maybe cover the solution and just try to, that's good. And also probably you will hear me a lot. Never, never miss a question from, the, from my session. Let's say this way, okay? Each question is quite, quite helpful, quite nice, okay? Okay, mm, example number four. Evaluate a function. That's mean again, it's, if we know what we're doing, it's a trivial question. But it's also important because we have to, having a function, having a like formula, a model, a, a, a recipe, we have to know how to deal with this. That means I can rewrite the function like f of x is defined as a square root 5 minus x squared. But we know if I will substitute 1, of course, I have to put 1. And I think we can get four, two. Oh, that was actually nice. If I will put two, I will, I have to substitute instead of x, two. Uh, square root of one, one. Oh, let's just do something. Maybe three. Oh, actually, can we actually do three? You see, I'm trying random numbers. I think no, so we can't really get, because we're getting a negative number. Let me remove this, no value, because x equals to 3, it's not in the domain. Because domain, okay, quantity under the square root must be positive or greater than 0. That means 3 is definitely, if I substitute 3, I'm not getting value greater than 0. That means I can't substitute 3, but for example. But we can see we can see the idea. Substituting x, I mean x is here. Substituting instead of x in one, one will go here two. Or maybe let's substitute um, t. Okay. Then I will put five minus t squared. Okay. Uh, but now what we have to do? We have to substitute x plus h. That's actually my question. The same thing, instead of x, they want us to put x plus h. And we can leave it, we can expand it, but we can just leave it, because that's the point. Instead of x, we have to put that value. Okay? 
actually, let me maybe solve this domain because we can factor out. Okay. Just in case if we end up, this is not part of this question, but just, yeah, just in case, because it's the quadratic inequality. That's when we can see the zeros are negative root five and positive root five. Uh, actually we have and we can test the interval if i will substitute big number uh, like like let's say let's say 10 and this will give me negative if i will substitute zero will be positive and negative and we're looking only for positive interval that means all of the numbers between negative root 5 and positive root 5 actually including because we may have exactly zeros that's the set of numbers that will give me a real output. Okay, that's just on the side, just the quadratic, don't worry for now. Okay. The, the point of this question is actually this final lab. But I just wanted to show you. Yes, I think yeah, I, we can leave it. Maybe the only thing that I was thinking, because the only, oh, that line is too long. Uh, the only thing that we can do, we can do five, and then I can like expand x plus h times x plus h will give me x squared plus two x h my plus h squared. All right? Because please remember we can't take the square root of this, and I can distribute negative, but it doesn't look simple. Okay, that means I will definitely yes, I think I will leave it like that. Depends because most of your questions are the multiple choice. That means you you will see what form we we want. Okay, but that's yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Let's keep moving. What is my next question? My next question is: Oh, average rate of change. Okay, using the figure below, estimate the average rate of change. Uh, of a number of farms in the U.S. between 1950 and 1970. Okay, that means on the vertical line we do have a number of farms in millions, and that's the time. Yes. And what we want? We want the rate of change. How the number of farms changed between 1950? That means this is the corresponding value was here, this is 1950, and 1970 is here, the corresponding value. Okay, that's what we know. Rate of change is actually almost what we did. The changes in Y over changes in X. That means Y, um, or maybe x, maybe x is easier because we do have values. x, on the x-axis, we do have the years. That means changes in years. I need this distance. Let me use the. I need that distance. That means how many years is between 1950 and 1970? Of course, you can do the math, and I think I can do it. I can write the difference. Oh, 19. 50. That means changes in years is 20. Okay. And now I have to find what is the corresponding value, number of farms, this number. In 1950, what do you think? Can you tell me this is, uh, I don't know, 5.4, 5, maybe my dot is a little bit, let's say 5.4. That means the corresponding value, number of farms for 1970 is 9.4. And now I need, uh, I need this point. Okay, uh, 2.8, let's say. Two. Uh, no, 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 I have to, because what I have to do, I always, because it's important to know the sign, I have to line up the values. That means the corresponding value for 1970, I have to place above, right? Because you see, I did put the other one, 2.8. And for 1950, 
5.4 and we subtract it. Always we have to line up. I can say f of x sub 2 minus f of x sub 1 and then x2 minus x1. Okay, that's the rate of change. That's, we have to like always line them up. We can switch them, but then we have to switch on the top. I was. Uh, okay, I mean, this is 2.8 minus 5.4, uh, 2.8, no, 2.6 negative. And dividing by 2 is 1.3. Uh, actually, no, no, 10.13, correct? Because we do have additional, additional 10. Okay, that's mean negative, and we can definitely see, yes, the number of times decrease. But what we did, we simply, the rate of change, it's simply a slope. Slope, and I don't know if we know the word secant line. Okay, slope of the line. But in respect to the blue curve, I have to find the line that passes through these two points. Slope of the secant line, rise of the line. That means this is my delta x, this is my delta y. Okay. And it's definitely correct, makes sense because it's negative. Uh, that means actually what this means, I maybe I should put like the units. I mean, this is like dimension, it's not dimension, but yeah, we have units because we have rate of change of uh, forms, a number of forms with respect to time. That means it's negative 0.13 million forms. We can maybe millions terms over year, over one year. Okay, that means millions of farms over one year. Uh, per one year was 0.13, like uh, the, the decreasing rate, decreasing rate. Okay, let's see, <laughs> let's keep moving. Um, oh, I have just. Uh, yeah, just a little bit of theory. That's mean I think I was lying. I, I said I'm not gonna cover it all, but okay, let's just look and then I probably I have a question related to this. That means having, uh, having a function in order to find a change in, in vertical distance, we know how to do it. Just the top value minus the bottom value. We just did this, it's delta, delta y. Okay? Uh, slope of the line or secant line, we will call average rate of change which means delta y over delta x. Changes in y's, changes in x. I can write, I can write delta y, and this is delta x. And, that's mean that, and this will represent the slope of the line. Okay, what we also have, we have something like a relative change in the quantity p. That means if we can find, if we can find uh, the changes, changes in the p-value and divide by the original quantity, then we will call that this is a relative change. It's not really, it's not like a rate of change. It's not like the changes just in y's. It's we call relative change. Let me, let's see how I, we can ask you. We can ask you this way. Now you can see this question focus on relative change. That means what we have. The number of sales per week is $75.99 uh, per of jeans. No, 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 no. Am I reading wrong? <laughs> the number of sales per week of $75.99 pairs of jeans is 25 per. Okay, that means that's the amount of dollars, but it's 25 pair of jeans. Okay, that means that's the sales per week. The number of weekly sales goes up uh, to 45 pairs when the, pair, when the price is reduced by 30.3%. Okay, that means find, okay? find the relative change in the weekly sales. That means what we can see, the important thing is the quantity at the moment, because we will not, yeah, we will not look at the dollars, we don't have any other... I mean, we can still find a price, but the quantity, yeah, that means what is yeah, the relative change? Uh, the, the, initial, the initial value, okay, the initial value is 25, 25 pairs, okay? 
that means the quantity salt goes up from 25 pairs of genes to 45. That means what we, what we will have, it's um, P1, let's say, it's 45. Okay. That means what we have, uh, what, is the, what is the difference? P1 minus P0, because that's what we need. We need a change in P. Okay. The relative change means that we need a change in the quantities and we still have to divide by the original quantity. That means P5 minus 25 and the original one was 25, the initial one. That means we do have 20 over 25. That means that the increase in the sales was 20 pair, from 25 to 45, 20. And how this 20 corresponds to the original quantity, 25? And we have to find this ratio. And I believe this is, we can divide, I mean, we can put, actually, I can multiply by 4, and I can write 0.8. That means 80%. It's big, and we can see it's almost double, 25, 45. Okay. That means the relative change is 80%. Yeah, that's, but that's important to know the formula. Remember, because you might use, use it. Okay. Always get the difference between the increase or decrease and put in the denominator the original, the initial quantity. Okay, relative change. Good, let's keep moving. Now what we have? Okay, another, uh, a cost function. You will see a lot in this class, even if we start adding a calculus, derivatives, integrals, um, you will see a cost function. Of course, the cost function is just giving me the total cost of producing a quantity Q, a Q of some goods. And uh, if, if the cost function is a line linear function, we will always have fixed costs defined as a vertical in uh, intercept, y-intercept. That's in having a, having a function, I can write it down, um, q plus b, that b will indicate a fixed cost. And the variable cost, variable cost, per unit will be represented by the slope. Okay, this will be represented by the slope. I mean, that's good, like uh, some good things to, to remember. Of course, we will have another function, the revenue function, which gives us the total revenue received by the fir uh, firm from selling a quantity, Q of the goods. And the profit is always the revenue minus the cost that we spend. Also, quite common sense. And I just copy the, the notation from your textbook that we may see these labels. Okay, let's see. Oh, I do have the graph. I should, I should cover the graph, but it's okay. That's what we have. We have a, a cost function which the question is actually asking, graph the cost function C uh, at Q is 24,000 plus 7Q. We kind of like change the order. It's the same, MX plus B. Label the fixed cost and the marginal cost. Okay, that's what we can see. The, um, what we have, the fixed cost, the fixed cost is of course 24, because we do have 24,000, that's the y-intercept, and the slope is changing per one unit, it's seven up. One unit and seven up, okay? Uh, that means uh, what we have. Um, the vertical intercept, one more time, represents the fixed cost, and the marginal cost is represented by the slope of seven, which is the change in cost corresponding to a unit change in the production. That means this is seven. We can see, we can right away, actually, I like red. That's the marginal and that's the fixed cost. Yeah, almost nothing to do because I do have the graph for you. Okay, let's see another one. Okay, 
I have another graph, but it's okay. Graph the cost function, the same function, 24,000 plus 7Q, and the revenue function, just 15 times Q. R of Q is 15Q on the same graph, the same axis. For what values of Q does the company make money? Okay, that's when we know both of them, the revenue is above the cost. That's when the company makes money. That's when we do have the point where they intersect. We call, uh, we call um, break even, break even point. Okay? That means break even point is the point that the company starts making the money, which means revenue is exactly the same like the cost, which means it's zero profit. Right, because if I subtract, it's the same value. But we can try to find out. Maybe we can count on the graph because the graph is the labels, the units are quite precise, quite exact. But we can also algebraically get this um, um, the quantity Q. Do you think what you know? What is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This corresponds to seven. That means each label, each line corresponds to a thousand. But do you see that is do you see that is three thousand? I hope you are there. Yes, you can type because I don't see you. I just see the list of students. <laughs> but okay, I just got from the graph. Sometimes I will not trust the labels. I will definitely calculate. That means fifteen Q must be the same like twenty four thousand plus seven Q. Let's subtract seven Q from both sides. And let's divide by 8. 24 divided by 8 is 3. 3,000. That means, yes, I was right reading the graph. Uh, okay, that means the company makes profit if, if it produces and sells more than uh, 3,000 uh, 3, items. Do we know what they're selling? We don't know what they're selling. Oh no, we know. Cost and revenue function for the radio manufacturer. Okay. I didn't type this here. Okay, that's we can see three. That's that's how we can compute the break even point. I mean the quantity. Actually, mm, they're not asking. Do you think you can tell me what is this quantity? What is number of dollars to produce or to sell, which will be the same? Um, um, 3,000 3, units. I mean, we can simply, it's 55, yes, because it's simply 3,000 times T. Mm -hmm. It's 45K. I like this. Yeah, 45K. Oh my God, it's sloppy. Thank you. Thank you, Mabi. That's, yeah, that's good. You can remove this 20, not 20, 45. 45k thousand. Okay, and we can see how we can play with the formulas. All of the formulas are extremely helpful. Okay, let's keep moving because I have more problems. As always, the math teacher has always problems. Okay, let's. Oh, yeah, I can hear somebody. <laughs> okay, what we have? Uh, we have the graph. That's mean figure below shows the cost and revenue. Uh, graph, a uh, gra uh, function for the company. That's revenue and that's cost. You may notice the cost function always starts like a lot from zero because we always have the fixed cost. Even before producing the items, we need, I don't know, we need a building. We have to pay the electricity bill. We have to pay rent or we always have some cost even before starting producing. And I think that's the reason that the cost function will start above. Okay, approximately, approximately what quantity does this company have to produce to make a profit? That means now, unfortunately, we don't have the formulas. I think you have to help me to read from the graph. That means what is this? The break even point. Okay. That means break even point will start giving a profit. Break even point. At how many quantities? Um, 340. Can you, can you 
can see and it is, I think it's 300, 400, 350, 340. Okay, between 340, it's the break even point. Uh, that means are producing 340 uh, or more, I mean producing more quantities than 340, company will start making a profit. Okay, and then estimate the profit generated by 600 units. Oh, 600 units, that we really, really like okay. to find the profit. And we can see profit is defined as a, a rough, I can put six. Profit producing 600 units will be calculated by knowing the revenue, okay? Producing of 600 units and the cost of producing a 600 units. That we have to get the values from. Okay, revenue is almost, almost 250. I will, uh, I mean 2400. And cost, mm, cost is this quantity. I don't know if I am uh, 17. No, it doesn't, it's really, it's really just, yeah, just the approximation. And that means what we have, $700. That means the profit generated by producing 600 units, it's $700. Okay, quite good. Okay, and I will skip this one for now. Okay, that means now the last part, it's the exponential function. Okay, like exponential and later we will have the logarithm. That means exponential function, like overall exponential function as simply function defined as a to the power of x. Because x is placed in the exponent, we call exponential function. Base of the exponential function, it's always positive, always. We can't have negative values. X domain could be any numbers. Okay, but this is just mathematically. Now let's see what kind of form or what kind of exponential model we will look in this section. That means let's say that P is an exponential function and we will call P of the function of T, that means the exponent is T. Yeah, like the exponent was X here. With the base A, that means the same base that I just drew. And we will always place a coefficient p sub zero is the initial quantity when t is zero. Because if t is zero, any number to the power of zero is one. That means this is, I can even put p at zero. Initial quantity is p sub zero. When time, when the t is zero. And a is the factor by which p changes when t increases, when t increases by one. That means we may have the base of this exponential function being greater than one. That means now, please remember, then we will always have an exponential growth. If the number is greater than one, the base. If the number is less than one, of course positive, then we will have exponential decay. Right, that's you always please remember. And then the, because if it's one, it's one, it's constant, nothing change. A being one, one to the power of any number is always one. That means this will not even change. That means we will always like split one plus that uh, decimal. That means R is a decimal representation of the percentage rate of the change. Okay. And could be positive, for uh, for the growth and could be negative for decay. Okay, that's that's how we kind of have to see this model. Okay. It's a to the power of t times initial quantity p sub zero. Okay, and I also type this information like we just did the linear function. Linear function has a constant rate of change, but exponential has the constant percent or like the relative rate of change. Okay, but we will yes we will talk about this later because the second part of chapter one is also about exponential and logarithmic. Okay? But we can see we will not have like the, the constant rate of change, constant rate percentage. Okay, and I can show you a few graphs. 
That means exponential function looks like that, grows if, if is exponential growth, if the base is greater than one, like 1.5 to the power of t, 2 to the power of t, 3 to the power of t, 5 to the power of t, 10. We can see how steep. And of course, we do have a natural exponential function, e to the power of t. Right? We probably remember from algebra class, e is a special number, really associate with the natural exponential and natural logarithmic function, and the value is like approximately 2.7. Okay? It's between 2 and 3. And I can, yes, I can tell you one thing, uh, exponential function like is increasing, but it's increasing extremely fast, really, really fast. We can even see like we're moving just one by one unit along the t, along the x-axis, and the values jumps really, really high. Okay? That means it's quite fast function. Okay? That means that's exponential growth, or I can show you exponential decay. The same exponential function, however, the value of a is less than 1. 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.95. Okay. Do I have e? Oh, no, e, I can't have e. If for some reason, I'm looking at this. e is greater than 1. It will be growth. <laughs> okay, and then what I have, I have two questions. Make sure that you understand this question. Let's see the first one. Suppose that the initial quantity of 25 milligrams of caffeine from a large coffee is metabolized by the body at the rate 14% per hour. Okay, that means I drink coffee and then the, the amount of the caffeine is, get, is getting down, right? It's metabolized. Write the expression that best represents the amount of the caffeine if the body after five hours. Okay, that means you can, we probably based on that word, I will say it's decay, right? Because it's getting down. That means it's 14% it's down. Initial amount was 25 milligrams. And T is going to be number of hours. That means what we have? We have T, we have initial amount, and we have A to the power of T. But we remember... We remember A, it's like one plus or minus my rate. Okay, that means the amount I could say A or P. Um, write the expression that the best represents the amount of the coffee. That means this will be the amount of the coffee. Initial amount was 250, and after how many years? Can you tell me this? I know I'm not asking. What shall I put here? Because I want to find a formula to represent the amount after five hours. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. I will put five. And I know that is 0. 0.14. And can you tell me, shall I put minus or plus? Minus, thank you, thank you. Okay. That means it looks like that if I would like to compute the amount of the caffeine, after five hours, I have to take 250 times 0.86, I believe, to the power of 5. That means this is the final answer. Okay, we can see, but I'm keeping that model. Make sure that you remember that model, exponential model. And negative, right? Negative because it's decay. We sub it's subtracting. It's the amount of the caffeine is not increasing. It's, of course, decreasing. And then I need another cup of coffee, right? Okay. I hope this is nice and easy. Now let's do, I think I supposed to have 10 problems, but I do have one more. Oh, did I type the solution? I can't believe it. <laughs> Can you see I, I, I type? Yeah, but it's nice to write for you. Okay, and then I have, oh, what I have? I have the last question. Let's try to answer. The quantity P is an exponential function of time. And it's defined like that. We know the model right now. Quantity P defined as an initial amount A to the power of number of times. I mean num number of, it, it, the time, T is time. Where A is a positive constant and P sub zero is the quantity at T zero, initial quantity. Suppose that we have information like that. Uh, initial amount P sub zero 
times a to the power of three equals to 45. That's in probably after, I don't know, let's say three years. Let's say time is in years. That means having an initial quantity like p sub zero, and after three years, the quantity is 45. Now, having the same initial quantity, but after four years, a to the power of four, the quantity is 48. Okay, some information. What are they asking? They asking us to find a uh, and p sub zero and state the rate of exponential growth or decay. Probably we can guess. Do you think it's gonna be growth or decay? Uh, of course, it's looking for the growth. Of course, that means this is we looking for the growth rate because 45, 48 is going up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yes, good point. Ryan and Maddie. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I have to do. I have to find uh, P sub zero and A. Let's start, I mean, either way. Maybe the first equation I can solve for P sub zero. Maybe that will be easier. And the second equation I can also solve for P sub zero. I can just divide by A to the power of three, A to the power of four. And now these both quantities are the same because this is initial amount and this is initial amount. 45 over a cubed, 48 over a to the power of four. Or oh, what I can do, I can cross multiply 48 a cubed. I can divide by a cubed. Okay, let me write here. I will have 45 a equals to 48. Yes, I did. Divide. I'm not writing this, but I did divide both sides by a cube, and I also I can divide by three, fifteen, and sixteen. Dividing by three, okay. I'm just saying this. Okay, that means a is sixteen over fifteen. Excellent. Which means is one plus one over fifteen. It's definitely greater than one, it's a growth. I mean, that we were expecting this. Uh, one over 15, um, I think it's zero, zero, six, six. If you will use the calculator, we will get this, okay? That means the percentage, oh, I use the, I mean the rate, the rate, the R, the rate. I mean, A is this. A is 1 plus 115, that's good. Oh, 1 plus 0 0.006. I can maybe write 1 plus this. Or shall I put 7? I will put 7. And the rate, I can just put the rate is 6.7%. Is Am I right? Yes, it's 6.7. 6 6 okay, that's we do have this. Um, okay, what else? Hang on, hang on. We have to find, oh, we have to actually find the initial amount. Oh, I didn't calculate the initial amount. In order to calculate the initial amount, I can pick one of the equations. Maybe this one, or maybe this one. Oh, that means we will have 45 over a which is 1.067 to the power of three. Oh, actually I didn't calculate this. Can you try to use the calculator? And I will try to use it now. Uh, how can I do this? I don't have my, um, okay, let's see. Let's see if you can get, Okay, I'm calculating, I'm here, 1.67. What did you get? I get something, let me say close, 37.04, but I can write 37. I just divide, you can take 45 and divide by, yes, okay, I got the same, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's just write, let's keep the, let's round it. Okay. That means 37, the quantity, because we have nice 45, 48, that we will just, we will just keep. 
because the rate of change, I mean, I mean no, not the rate of change, the rate of growing, the rate of growing is one over 15. That's probably the reason that we're getting this new number. Okay, but you know, you know how to, how to deal with this. You know the formula, this is the answer and this is the answer. Okay? That means make sure that you know the model, the equation, uh, and how to like manipulate and switch the numbers around. Okay, that was my last question. And thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. And I hope this time is good. If not, you can always tell me, maybe we can change a little bit, but I will prefer the, because we always like to offer one day session. Right? You can probably, maybe it's around the lunch time, that means you can, even if you're working, or maybe you can skip the lunch and join my session. Or, of course, you can always rewatch it because it's recorded and the, the recording will be provided for you. Okay, thank you very much for joining me.